the program is Spirit, Mind, Body. And, uh, we, we're talking this afternoon with Rabbi Arya Kaplan about Kabbalah. And that was his translation of, uh, of, of part of Ezekiel's vision from his book called Meditation in the Bible, which is published by Samuel Weiser's in New York City, and which brings a, a very fresh, direct uh, a, approach to Jewish mysticism and to the techniques of meditation that, that uh, are inherent in the, in the prophetic tradition. At one time, uh, there, there were schools of prophecy. It was, there were like mystical schools in which, uh, in which people were... Um, we're, we're trained systematically in this way. Then I, I, I think you, you mentioned in your book, after the exile, there was a kind of reaction against that kind of thing. Well, that, or, the fact that that people looking for spirituality, it, 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 it's always a danger because when a person, when people are looking for spirituality, anybody can set themselves up as a spiritual master, and the common people very often can have have no way of telling the true from the false. And it seems in, during the time of the First Temple, there was an awful lot of false spirituality, a lot of perverted spirituality being found among the Jewish people. And they found, and it was decided that's, that it's better to make it into a secret teaching. It seems during the time of the First Temple, by the way, this, the whole mystic tradition was out in the open. It was taught publicly to, if one takes the Talmud's word for it, to literally millions of people were practicing it. But the time of the Second Temple, and I, I mentioned earlier, earlier in the program, that the one thing that was taken as a substitute for it was the daily prayer service. This became the daily meditative uh, pr practice and exercise given over to all Jews was to say the Amida, the Shemon Esrei, three times a day and have each one according to his own level the unification or spiritual experience. So I, I hope that, that the time will come in, in, in our time when, again, millions of people will be practicing, will be practicing Jewish mysticism and, and, and be, having it be taught openly and, and not, not, not to get away from the, the precious soil of orthodoxy, but, but, but also to reinfuse orthodoxy with its true meaning, which is, a, which is as, you, as you experience, a kind of a mystical experience. Well, for, well for, I can give you a, a, a good example. Many people come into synagogue and it seems so sterile sp spiritually that they're turned off, especially among our young people. The young people not per perhaps not raised in a strong Orthodox background. And they don't realize that the amount of spiritual energy that's potentially there is tremendous. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a very funny thing that, I, that happened to me uh, oh, a few months ago. I remember I was once in, I was in a synagogue. And as you know, they, they usually have lay people and lead the service. And, it, and, and anybody in the congregation can lead the service. And this person, this time... The person leading the service was a particularly obnoxious person. I mean, really uh, an obnoxious... I, I knew him to be an obnoxious person, and he's leading the service obnoxiously. And I was really... <laughs> I, was, I was really sitting... It's sit, sit, good to see a mystic can, can still uh, sense obnoxiousness you know, when, when he sees it. <laughs> I, 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 and, and, and I was sitting there feeling all kind of bad, bad, vibe, bad vibes from this person. And all of a sudden I realized, who am I? Am I, am I really be that much better than that person? Aren't I being awful, awful, awfully arrogant? And I just closed my eyes and started listening to him. I said, as he's praying to God, and I closed my eyes and just flowed with him. And I must say, this was one of the most intense spiritual experiences I ever had in my life. So the question really is, besides what's there, how much of a chance is one willing to give it? One can say, well, I'm turned off by this. Or on the other hand, one could go and just fly with it. And there's a lot to fly with. Mm -hmm. And that story beautifully illustrates as well that real deep mystical experience is not necessarily something one can apply a technique to and, and have it happen. It might, it might come to one under the most unexpected circumstances. As There must have been many times when you were meditating in solitude and you were ready for a very deep experience and, and it didn't necessarily come. But here in the, in the midst of this uh, 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 trying to hassle with the bad vibes in the synagogue, uh, that's when it happened. But of course, it wouldn't have happened if you hadn't prepared yourself with, you know, in, with your meditations in solitude. But I think that's an important thing to point out, just in general, to people who who are are being bombarded with all sorts of new spiritual techniques. Uh, you, you can turn the tape over the, the, the uh, that little one. Uh, who are being bombarded with all sorts of spiritual techniques and and 
are being made to thought to think you know that that just the te technique itself will will uh, immediately bring on the experience and i think that's a distortion don't, uh, don't you well i thought there there certainly there certainly are techniques but the ma the main the main thing is to, is to be spiritually open now if a per if a person if a person is spiritually closed then the, then then the person could try all the techniques in the world and i think i th i think what I, what I also what I also also find from my own experience is a lot of spiritual techniques tend to be more theater than than substance. Yeah. I mean, it's very easy to be very spooky and very <laughs> and very uh, and 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 to speak very deep and appear very deep. And any good, but something any good actor could do. What a person really has to do is is be a searcher of the truth. I can tell you a very interesting story on this. I was going to hit, so. hit you before the yeah. Yeah, before, like before the before the program. As you as you probably know, one of the greatest rabbis alive today is Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who has who's uh, who's on the east side, and he's not very well known. Well, being one of the greatest rabbis in the world, he gets questions from all over the from all over the world. People come to him from all walks of life, and eventually, was decided that he's going to need a secretary. He's going to need somebody to to just preserve his privacy to some degree. So the first week, he has this he has this secretary. A woman comes to, comes knocking on the door, and and says she wants to see Rabbi Feinstein. So the secretary says, "What? Well, what do you want to see him for? I mean, it has to be something very important. Otherwise, we can't let everybody just bother him." She says, "Well, I need him to read a letter for me." And the secretary says, "To read a letter? I mean, you're bothering the great Rabbi Moshe Feinstein <laughs> to read a letter? What's wrong with you? I mean, people." Are coming to him with questions that that affect the future of the entire Jewish community, the, the entire world community, and you're coming to him to read a letter. How dare you do this? I mean, you think he's going to read a letter for you? And the woman says, "I don't know. Every time in the past when I came to him, he read it for me." And I think this this shows a certain thing about. The true, the, the the true great person, and perhaps the true mystic, like Rabbi Nachman says, that the greater a person is, the lower down he could reach. Can you give us now with with that with a preamble about about techniques and and can you can you share with us maybe Rabbi Nachman's uh, one of Rabbi, Rabbi Nachman's ways, actual techniques that people can can use in their daily life? Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. I might introduce, for those in the audience who don't know who he is, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. He lived around the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century. He was a great-grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, who was the founder of the Hasidic movement, and probably one of the most articulate advocates of Jewish meditation in the past uh, few centuries. He felt that uh, Jewish meditation should be open to anybody. And many of the methods that were in vogue at the time were very, very complex and difficult methods which required years of training. The Baal Shem Tov, to some degree, had brought it down. As I mentioned earlier, the Baal Shem Tov had made prayer, the daily worship service, into a meditation. But Rabbi Nachman felt for many people even this was too difficult. So he said that if you want to meditate, go out someplace where nobody's going to bother you. Go out into a field, in, in, a, in, in a quiet street, of course, some place where you won't be mugged. Or in a room by yourself, or under your covers at night, or sitting, or sitting perhaps in the house of study, looking at a book, so nobody will disturb you. And just talk to God. Talk to the divine, in your own words. Quietly, deeply, with longing and yearning for unification. Express your own words to God. Do this, he says, for an hour every day. This is the method used by the greatest people in the world and the greatest mystics. It doesn't require any training. It doesn't require any great knowledge. Just your own words. And his students started doing this. Once one of his students came to him and said, But Rebbe, Rebbe, I don't have any words. I sit and nothing comes. What do I do then? Rabbi Nachman said, take the words, Rebainai Shal Oilam, Lord of the universe, Rebainai Shal Oilam, and just say it 
over and over and over and over again. Ribbayna shalaylam. 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 It is told that years later, a chassid came to Rabbi Nachman and said, in my city, we have a great genius. He's, we have a man there who knows a thousand pages of the Talmud by heart. Can you imagine that? A person knowing a thousand pages of the Talmud by heart? And Rabbi Nachman said, that's very impressive. But I have a little chassid who could say, Rebbeinu Shalaylam a thousand times and I consider him just as great you wouldn't you wouldn't can you do that right now can you can can, can you talk to God sort of for, sort of for us as, as, as we we're all joined together or is it too, something too intimate that much too intimate much too intimate. It's very, it's very interesting. The Kabbalists very often speak of the joining of a human being to the divine in sexual terms. In fact, in the Lurianic writings, one of the reasons that they're considered a bit taboo is because of the tremendous amount of, of sexual imagery that he uses. And in general, the meditative experience, the true meditative experience, is seen, seen as something so intimate that a person would no, law, would no sooner do that, you know, pr- publicly the, as one would do the the other thing. <laughs> I I wish I could. I mean, I would. I would I would rather stick to things that are more perhaps more structured. This is something I said that a person could just speak, you know. Well, we we all felt it, you know, when you when you when you were repeating the oh, master of the universe. So so that was not, that was really enough of a hint. I mean, a person, any person though, can sit down in a quiet place and just start. Rebbeinu Shalom. Oh God, help me, bring me close to you. I want you. I want to experience you. I want to feel the sweetness and infinite joy of being close to you. Everybody has his own words for this. Mm-hmm. And I think it would, if I went, try to go any further than that, it would just be contrived. No, but it's, it, I, I, I think that you did, a fragrance of it did, did come, come through. And up to, up to this point, I mean, I've, I've always felt that, that that was a pretty unsophisticated, spiritually unsophisticated way of praying. You know, that that uh, uh, in, in those simple words like that, I, I always thought that med- meditation would have to be some sort of exalted idea of you know uh, merging with the Ein Sof or something like that. Ein Sof. Ein Sof. But this, this is Rabbi Nachman's teaching that mm. a child could meditate. Mm. The most ignorant person. Of course, this is part of the Hasidic tradition: was to reach down to everybody. Whereas, and we really, this, this, is where, this is where the Hasid, Hasidic tradition broke up from the Kabbalistic tradition, whereas the Kabbalistic tradition, one could call it elitist, that usually the, most of the people involved in it were geniuses and, and, and great scholars. The Hasidic tradition brought us all down to the most common person, to, to, to the beggars and the shopkeepers and the peasants. And Rabbi Nachman just brought it down a step further. I mean, what, his method, and he, as he says... The smallest, the smallest child, the most simple person could do, could could make use of this method, and yet the greatest scholar and the and the most spiritually advanced person can still mm. 
can go further with it. I think this was the, this is the. It's a beautiful unification of, of of all the different levels, and I think that it would be so important if people realize that meditation is something that can be partaken of by the most simple childlike person and and the most advanced person. And, and in fact, that's what that's what brings them together. That there's that's where their soul. Uh, they, they they see that their soul is the same. See another another, th- another thing Rabbi Nachman taught in this is that re- that that really whereas most Kabbalistic meditations and so, as I said there's a whole literature on Kabbalistic meditation you really needed a a very very skilled master otherwise it would be very easy to go astray. In his method he felt that anybody who would begin this method would automatically go on the straight path and w- and would adva- and could advance without any outside help. Mm-hmm. So it 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 was it, it, it was it was and is. A very powerful method. Incidentally, I, I I might mention that this summer I'll be translating Hishtapchus Anefesh, "Pour Out Your Soul," in English, which is going to be which is Rabbi Nachman's teachings on meditation. It will be published by mm. the Breslova Group, Rabbi Nachman's Chassidim. Mm. Uh, I might mention at this point that uh, we have been talking with with Rabbi Arya Kaplan, and he he does give a Monday evening class. Uh, at at 8:30 uh, down in his his home in Brooklyn, and I have in fact the re- reason I met REA was through some friends who attended this class and were, were receiving a great deal of nourishment from it. So uh, I might give a telephone number where where people can get in touch with with uh, Rabbi Kaplan. It's 851-1519. Obviously, please don't call on a Friday evening or a Saturday, but any other time and within reason. Uh, call and, and um, are people uh, invited just to come to a single class just to see what it's like, or do they? Sure, you know? sure. I, and it's, a, it's in a, it's a kind of an, a, from what I've heard, I've never had the good fortune to go yet, but it, it's in a, a, a real intimate old, old-fashioned family atmosphere, you know, where where the, where you 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 see, you see, uh, the rabbi as as not some, some sort of exalted sage dwelling on a mountain peak but someone who's living right in the midst of life and uh, and Arya Kaplan is a is a is a fantastic scholar there are many many things that he knows but at the same time I I've, I've been impressed today and I'm sure everyone has felt you know, a, a real a real a live soul here and a, and 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 a great gentleness that that sort of comes uh comes out of uh, you get glimpses of it. There's no, there's no pretension in this. So, those of you who might want to go to a Monday evening class, that's 8:30. Uh, give, uh, give him a call at 851-1519. And again, uh, at, at Samuel Weiser's bookstore, you can, you can order. And if you live out of town or would have a hard time getting to Brooklyn, you can at least take a look at his, at these two books that are, have just been published: Meditation and the Bible, and. Uh, more recently, the Bahir, which will, which is a mystical text that you, that you'll be able to really get a feeling, a direct feeling, like going into the sources. Although meditation in the Bible has, a lot of it, a great deal of it, is is our quotations freshly and sometimes translated for the first time from Hebrew. Mostly, mostly of uh, of uh, some of the masters of Kabbalah, uh, all going all stretching all the way back. Maybe you could, R. A. Perhaps you could you could. Uh, Give another another approach to meditation. You were thinking about the 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 the, the other approach to the, the, sh- the shema. I yeah. mentioned the shema. Yeah. In fact, earlier in the program, I mentioned the, when speaking about the speaking silence. I mentioned the importance of listening. But and and every Jew knows the creed of the Jew is Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Deuteronomy six four. But how often do we really think and contemplate what these words are? I mean, the message there is God is one. Okay. There's a basic unity to all creation. But there are six words here. Start saying, listen, Israel. You have to learn how to listen. Number one. Listening is essentially a, a med- listening correctly is essentially a meditative exercise. Also, Hashem Elokeinu. God is our Lord. This is a very important thing. We usually don't think about it, perhaps. That, what does it mean we say God is our Lord, or Lord, the Lord is our God, or Hashem is our God, depending how you translate. What does it mean our God? It means that we have access. Although Hashem Echad, although God is one, although the, 
you're speaking about an unimaginable unity, a unity beyond anything that the human mind can grasp. Or as the Zohar says, Leis machshavat klal, that thought cannot grasp you at all. And the first Lubavitcher Rebbe puts it very puts it very nicely in Tanya, where he writes that just like the hand cannot grasp a thought, so the mind cannot grasp the divine. Uh-huh. But still, Hashem Elokeinu, He's ours. This God is ours. He's not something something abstract, something that just exists. He's something we have access to. But but for this to come to come about, you have to listen. You have to learn to listen. You have to learn to open your mind, to open every cell in your brain, so that this message of unity comes into it. And perhaps one of the best meditations of all. And one of the most effective that I've, that, I, that I've used has been the Shema itself, these six words. I mean, just let us think of the words Shema, listen, Yisrael, Israel, Hashem, the Lord, Elokeinu, our God, Hashem, the Lord, Echad is one. Can you use that as a mantra? I mean, would that be something to repeat with each Not breath? repeating. No, okay. not repeating. Just to say it once, very, very slowly, and very, very deeply. Let's, let's try it. Let's try it here. I'm not going to say the exact words. I'm, instead of saying the divine name, since we are on the air and not in a real prayer mood, I'm going to be saying Hashem instead of the divine name. But I think the general mood will come across. We prepare ourselves. Actually, in the morning service as an introduction to the Shema. The prayer service starts out, we go up to the cosmic world, to the world of the stars and the planets. Then the service takes us up even higher to the world of, world of angels. And in, in the prayer service, we speak about how the angels sing praise, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole world is filled with his glory. And we go yet higher, blessed is the glory of God from his place. And we go yet higher, and higher and higher till we come to Ahavas Olam, the universe of love. And we enter into this universe of love and the universe of unification. And finally, when we have reached that level, we're ready to, to, to listen. And at that point, we say the Shema. Shema
It's interesting. In the Torah, the very next word is Ve'ohavta, which is usually translated, and you shall love. The correct translation is, and you will love. If you really listen, the love comes of its own. Arya, thank you very much for for coming and, and helping create the, uh, a kind of Shabbos mood already a little a little before before the fact. Uh, again, people who want to get a hold of, of Arya Kaplan can can call him at eight five one one five one nine. But if you want to talk to him here in the studio, he said he'll stay around a little bit after the program. Uh, we didn't take phone calls on the air because we wanted to do meditation on the air, but. If you just so you feel that you're not cut off, that you can be in contact with 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 people who you listen to on WBAI, you could call a studio at two seven nine zero nine three seven. Be patient, hang on. It's a call holding system. If it's ringing, it'll get through. Two seven nine zero nine three seven. And I, I mentioned uh, again that that this program has been uh, what we now call Spirit Mind Body because someone else has a program called Body, Mind, Spirit, and they've been complaining. <laughs> so we're, we've actually rearranged it in a, in a, in a more accurate order. Uh, we're, he, we're here on, on BAI every uh, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoons from 1 till 2, just trying to give you a glimpse of, of a, a mysterious way of being human, which is, which is a, a sacred way, and which, which, which is a way in which we hope that the 80s will begin to, to turn us in, uh, in order to... Uh, integrate life and 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 pull together what's becoming a kind of dehumanized abstract society into something that's re really rooted in the heart and the spirit. And, uh, on Monday evenings from eight till nine, I do a television program now called In the Spirit. Uh, it's on Channel C cable. Uh, if you try to get to a friend who's got a cable uh, south of 86th Street, because there's a, so some confusion about the, the the north of 86th Street cable system right now, so. Uh, next next Monday, Bernie Glassman, a wonderful Jewish Zen master, who <laughs> just moved to Riverdale, uh, will will be on. So that's uh, eight to nine on and on Channel C on Monday evenings. Uh, Ari, thanks again, and and uh, it's been my pleasure being here. It's been a joy.